Now, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, the distinguished ambassador. He was born in 1944, uh, and he joined the Foreign Service in 1966 at the age of 22. Uh, and he served in uh, Indian missions uh, from 1968 to 1984. Uh, in Moscow, San Francisco, in Dhaka, and also in the Ministry of External Affairs. And has also been, uh, interestingly enough, Secretary to the Atomic Energy Commission uh, of India. Uh, in July 1984 to December uh, 1985, he was uh, Joint Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. He was also uh, then thereafter Joint Secretary to the Prime Minister uh, from 1986 to July 1991 responsible for foreign affairs, defense, science, and technology. So he is very uh, appropriate that he gives us the uh, uh, keynote address. Uh, he was ambassador to Mexico, ambassador to Russian Federation, ambassador to Germany, high commissioner to the UK. And so he has a wide uh, range of diplomatic experience. He has also participated in several summit meetings in the United Nations, Commonwealth, uh, non-aligned movement, Six Nation, Five Continent Peace Initiative, you name it, he has been at it all. So uh, he's married and has, uh, on the, they have one uh, daughter. I don't know whether she's going to Yale or not, but uh, 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 if she's not, she should be. But uh, <laughs> well, with these words of welcome, I would request uh, Ambassador Sen to deliver his uh, keynote address. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan, for your uh, warm words of introduction and for your insights. It's, uh, uh, and I would like to, at the outset, I'd I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan, who has been honored uh, uh, with a very high award from the President of India uh, just recently on the occasion of our, uh, our Republic Day. Uh, uh. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, happy to see uh, uh, such a distinguished audience, uh, uh, people, familiar faces whom we know, because uh, Ambassador Rick Enderfurth, Ambassador Desi uh, Schaefer, our Consul General, uh, Neelam Deo, uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Armin Choksi up there. Uh, Good to see you, and uh, wish you a very good morning. And it's highly pri I'm highly privileged to have been given this opportunity uh, to speak at this venerable institution of uh, uh, iconic uh, stretcher. I'm sorry that my daughter has not been to Yale. She went to another place uh, called Duke, and earlier she was in Claremont, small. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, and but uh, she missed the year, but it's not too late. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I congratulate uh, uh, Yale University and for taking this timely initiative in organizing the symposium. And I would like to especially appreciate the work which has been done by Dr. Jo George uh, Joseph and all his colleagues, including uh, Barbara Papagoda. And I thank you for you are arranging this uh, event. Uh, first, uh, very briefly, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, according to conventional wisdom, uh, it, the relationship in, uh, between India and the United States was, uh, basically it was bad during the uh, time of the Cold War and after the Ber uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the wisdom, the given wisdom is that things improved and allowed a natural partnership to evolve. It sounds very logical but uh, and it's widely believed, but I think it's untrue. The reality is that our relationship was good at times, it was bad at times, but it was indifferent for long periods of time. It had good beginnings and right at the time of, uh, and we all, in India, we all remember uh, uh, the invaluable 
support, the strong sentiments of support, which was expressed by President Roosevelt and other very prominent Americans for our independence movement. Our constitution was deeply influenced by the US constitution. Uh, at that time, you didn't have very strong IPR regulations, but it, you know, our, uh, we, <laughs> We had uh, our Bill of Rights, I mean, the Bill of Rights was almost uh, completely incorporated in our, what's known as uh, uh, fundamental rights in our Indian, Indian Constitution. Uh, and uh, it, so the U.S. influence was great, uh, even though I'd say that Dr. Ambedkar uh, made the mistake of not studying at Yale. He was of all places in Colombia. Uh, and it started off well with Nehru's first visit there, despite his remark that, you know, one should never visit the United States for the first time. Uh, it's, uh, it was successful with it. He got on pretty well with President Eisenhower. And uh, uh, particularly when uh, uh, Mr. Krishna Menon uh, and uh, John Foster Dulles was not there in that room. Uh, but, uh, and, and Eisenhower's own visit uh, was highly successful. He was greeted with uh, very great enthusiasm wherever he went. And uh, the relationship, of course, reached its lows during the time of Nixon, Bangladesh, and also during the Carter presidency. But they were revived during the Reagan years. And uh, it was, in fact, we saw the longest period of what I would call a benign neglect. It was after the Cold War period for a long time. And uh, benign neglect on both sides, I would say. And before it was, there was a jolt given by the 1998 nuclear test by India. And of course, after that, we had this incident uh, known as the Kargil conflict. And, and thereafter, uh, a very historic visit made by President Clinton to India. Uh, of course, First Lady, then First Lady Hillary Clinton beat him to it because she went there earlier in her own capacity as First Lady. But that was a truly historic landmark in a relationship. And this relationship uh, gained unprecedented heights since the inception of the Bush administration. And since then, it's been accelerating very rapidly and is being transformed into a truly uh, strategic partnership. This uh, transformation, ladies and gentlemen, is not on the basis of any single strategic goal, but it is dynamic and multifaceted, and the changes are profound and palpable, and are manifesting themselves in different areas. I'll just give you a broad picture of some developments, uh, and uh, just to give you an idea, I'll just restrict, restrict myself to initiatives which have been taken just in the last two years to give you a flavor of the range and the extent of the transformation of this relationship. Uh, we, uh, there was a process known as the uh, Next Steps in Strategic Partnership, it was, uh, or the NSSP as it's called, which was initiated by President uh, Bush and Prime Minister Wajpai in January uh, 2004. It was rapidly, the process was completed with stages two and three being dovetailed and by, completed by June 2005 just on the eve of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's visit to India. And uh, this envisaged cooperation in civil nuclear energy, in civil in use of space, and um, also uh, high technologies, dual use technologies, and in missile defense. Uh, the high technology cooperation group has been energized, and it's dealing with uh, issues uh, concentrating, focusing right now on biotechnology, nanotechnology, of course, information and communication technology, and uh, it's added on defense technologies. Uh, in the field of defense, uh, uh, we had in June, again, again 2005, uh, also the conclusion of a landmark uh, agreement, a 10-year uh, uh, program a perspective of cooperation in the field of defense, which included uh, uh, also uh, cooperation and collaboration 
in defense, uh, procurement, and uh, production. Uh, the uh, and also there's been another feature which is uh, virtually I mean hardly a month goes by without some exercise or the other taking place between our navies, uh, uh, armies, air forces, special forces in various uh, different areas, and that has given a lot of confidence and built up uh, mutual trust and. Uh, respect for each other's capabilities. Uh, trade is growing in both directions, uh, and uh, and I would like to say that uh, there is an imbalance, in, at least in terms of uh, trade and goods, uh, which needs to be corrected. I th and so uh, it's been my endeavor to uh, try to promote. Uh, U.S. exports to India uh, as uh, actively or aggressively as I try to promote Indian exports to the United States. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad that U.S. exports to India are growing uh, faster than Indian exports to the United States. Uh, the same is happening in the field of investments. Uh, I remember when I was in London and I first reached London uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2004, uh, sorry, in 2002, uh, I was considered rather eccentric, you know, because when people give me a very patient listening when I told them that, look, uh, uh, you'll shortly have, there'll be a time when uh, Indian investments in the United Kingdom would equal British investments in India. Uh, but now that's not only come true, but actually Indian investments in the United Kingdom exceed British investments in India. And uh, in fact, last year was the first year, uh, and this is a worrisome development, but I'm mentioning it to you, because for, it's for the first year, the first time that uh, investments into India, uh, by India uh, abroad, exceeded uh, investments uh, in our country. Uh, but that is the general direction which we are headed, and that's a, a healthy trend. We have an economic dialogue which has been revitalized uh, uh, and uh, which also resulted in the setting up of a CEO's forum, which has provided very valuable inputs. Uh, we have uh, embarked on a, a knowledge initiative in the field of agriculture, which brings in universities, research institutions, uh, corporate America, corporate uh, India. And uh, this agricultural knowledge initiative, we have backed it with uh, funding of uh, over $100 million for the next three years. Uh, and uh, this is vitally white, important for us because this is an area where uh, the Indian economy has not done as well as it should have done. And we can do much better and we hope that this initiative will yield tangible benefits. And in fact, uh, we hope that it will become a uh, result in a second uh, uh, green revolution in India by increasing productivity, uh, cutting down shortages and uh, uh, maximizing uh, 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 the uh, increasing uh, rather rapidly the income to farmers by processing and packaging of agricultural produce. Uh, energy is another very critical area where we just in the last two years, this is one area where we launched a dialogue. Uh, of course, the most uh, visible has been the civil nuclear initiative, which is vitally important both in terms of symbolism and substance. But it's not been restricted to the n nuclear uh, cooperation in the sense of uh, it's been broader because it's included uh, uh, collaboration uh, or exchanges in the field of oil and gas, the field of power, field of coal, where we've joined what is known as a future gen project for clean coal uh, uh, technologies and also in uh, energy efficiency and new and renewable forms of energy. And I mention this uh, uh, initiative uh, in particular because uh, I think that the greatest challenge which India is going to face is um, infrastructure in general, but most specifically where we are the most vulnerable is in the area of energy uh, and uh, water scarcity and the need to address these two issues, 
which are actually interlinked. Uh, we have taken several other initiatives, so just to give you an ex another example, an open skies mm, agreement uh, uh, was uh, signed and uh, this didn't rem remain on paper and since then in the last few months you've seen uh, uh, three American uh, US airlines uh, uh, commencing direct non-stop flights to India. They'll be followed by several more and uh, this trend is going to continue, and both in terms of passenger traffic and cargo traffic. Uh, we have launched Trade Policy Forum, which is uh, headed by our Commerce and Industry Minister and the USTR, Susan Schwab. In fact, uh, Susan Schwab is right now, even as we speak, in, in Delhi. This meeting is taking place, the fourth meeting of this uh, forum. And the US has two such forums, two other such forums, one with the European Union and one with China, and ours is the third uh, such forum. And I expect, uh, I hope um, uh, what I'm going to say is not, uh, I think that at the end of it they're going to announce or they have all, I think, announced today or they'll announce tomorrow the setting up of a private sector advisory group uh, to provide inputs to this uh, trade policy forum. Uh, cooperation in uh, maritime uh, security, of course, prevention of privacy, uh, piracy rather, uh, pollution, uh, search and rescue missions, uh, dealing with emergent situations. Uh, that's underway. It's, we've, um, we have an agreement and we're implementing that. Uh, we had a science and technology agreement which is languishing for 10 years, 10 long years. We focused on that uh, and within a couple of months or so we got that agreement finalized and we followed that up again with setting up a science and technology fund to uh, promote uh, uh, to uh, promote certain projects which uh, are amenable to industrial uh, application and backed it up with uh, uh, significant funding. Uh, a number of other initiatives have been taken by us in, within the last two years uh, with have global implications in the field of democracy, for instance, promotion of democracy. Uh, it was natural that the uh, UN Democracy Fund was launched um, by uh, President Bush and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh at the United Nations in the presence of uh, heads of state and government of both old democracies and new democracies and what we call democracies in transition. We are active uh, participants in the uh, coalition of democracies and we've also decided, both of us, uh, simultaneously to join uh, the governing board of the Budapest-based uh, institution which is uh, for on democracy and democracies in transition. Uh, our cooperation of course in the field of uh, uh, in the area of uh, combating international terrorism that preceded 9-11 uh, it's acquired uh, new momentum thereafter uh, and uh, uh, we are, we have a shared interest, a very strong shared interest in preventing proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and our uh, worst case national security nightmare would be a combination of the two, that's nuclear terrorism. Uh, after the tsunami, you know that uh, uh, we as a country, uh, though we were hit by the tsunami, uh, 1400 miles of our coastline was affected, but we, uh, we were, uh, we did not receive aid, we rather joined in the, uh, in a very active program to uh, uh, assist those uh, countries who uh, were affected in our neighborhood, particularly Sri Lanka and Maldives. And, uh, and at that time I remember uh, the, the spontaneous support we, we got from the uh, from the people of the United States uh, and the solidarity, which was uh, very heartwarming. And uh, the visit uh, to the embassy, we were uh, privileged to receive President Bush Sr. and President Clinton. And, uh, and of course, uh, the current President Bush uh, and the First Lady Laura Bush it didn't strike me at that time that all these, the, the current and the, 
two former presidents were all uh, from Yale. It didn't strike me at that time, but now <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it just happens to be so. But we we uh, didn't uh, we had a cooperation, a core group, uh, which was set up, which is uh, consisting of the United States, uh, India, and we included Japan and uh, the Australia in this uh, uh, in this venture. Uh, but we followed that up by a U.S.-India Disaster Response Initiative, which is working out quite well. Similarly, we have taken uh, initiatives in combating HIV-AIDS and other pandemics like the avian flu. Uh, very shortly, uh, uh, for the first international conference on avian flu will be held in, uh, in Delhi. And in the field of environment and a num number of other areas. Uh, so this would just give you uh, just a flavor of, uh, as I said, the, the extent of some of the initiatives which have just taken in uh, the last two years, and this is just some of them. There are others. But uh, while there are several others, I would just like to briefly touch on two other, uh, one other subject, that's uh, cooperation in the field of education. And I attach very high importance uh, to this uh, area of our cooperation. Uh, very high priority because there's much talk about the what we call the demogra demographic dividend uh, you know because with uh, more than half our population uh, uh, below the age of uh, 25 and uh, so you know the, uh, the the general theory is that with growing numbers of both uh, we'll be having growing numbers of both producers as and consumers in India at the time when there'd be uh, a large number of uh, increasing number of pensioners, not only in the West but uh, in, in Japan, China, and elsewhere. But uh, I believe, and I believe very strongly, that uh, much of this, uh, in fact, will not be achieved unless we do something and uh, we take some radical steps to address the problem of uh, uh, the lack of adequate educational facilities, particularly uh, starting with uh, from primary school and mid-school level, and but also in the field of uh, higher education. And uh, we will have to, uh, without investments and without concerted uh, efforts uh, on an emergency footing, I, I do not think that we will be able to realize the, uh, the advantages or, or realize what is this I refer to as the demographic dividend. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to say in this context that there is, uh, we are enc I'm encouraged that there have been some, uh, some cooperation already taken place, like there's been some cooperation in, uh, on distance education group of U.S. universities, and I'm also glad that uh, just within the last two years, we're just talking of the two-year perspective, as compared to the past, the number of uh, visits by university presidents, uh, provosts, and other um, have, uh, others have more than quadrupled, and I hope this ten trend will be maintained, as also other trends, like the numbers of senators and congressmen visiting India has, the last two years uh, also has quadrupled. Little, in fact, a uh, little bit more than that. It's about uh, increased by 450%. Uh, number of CEOs of major companies visiting India have become much more, uh, visits have become much more focused, but the numbers of it also have more than tripled. And uh, these developments just give you some idea of the new direction, the new content, and momentum of the evolution of the strategic partnership, which, as Professor Srinivasan rightly pointed out, is of mutual benefit to the to India and the United States, and it also has a profound positive impact in a global perspective. With regard to the prospects for the future, very briefly, a uh, little bit of crystal ball gazing. Uh, first, much has changed in the world. You've had the end of the Cold War, but the emergence of new threats. The U.S. is unquestioned and the, uh, by, any, uh, uh, by any criteria, 
the world's only superpower. But still, even then, the US cannot, on its own, handle uh, the problems which I refer to, the problems which are new problems which have emerged, uh, the new challenges and threats which have emerged in the post-Cold War era. So it is not a unipolar world, and I don't think it will be unipolar. The second uh, is that India is also changing. Uh, sometimes we confuse uh, many people, including ourselves, uh, by some developments, we sometimes take two steps forward, one step backwards, but basically we are moving ahead in the right direction. And we are no longer just the world's l biggest democracy, the largest democracy, but the world's fastest growing democracy. And I believe that unless we really make a mess of things, it's, it's inevitable that it's a question of when and not a question of if we will emerge as one of the world's three largest economies. The third factor is that India's growth, economic growth, is not threatening the interests of others, regionally or in a global perspective. Foreign trade will play a much greater role and this will be a positive uh, factor in sense of our integration to the global economy, but our growth will be propelled not so much by exports, but by domestic demand. Uh, fourthly, our economic growth has demonstrated that development and democracy are not just compatible. People thought that they were not compatible, but we have demonstrated that they're not just compatible but inextricably linked. In the longer term, we feel, I feel certainly, that globalization in the economic sense will be stable and sustainable in the longer term only if it is accompanied by greater uh, democratization both within and between countries. Fifthly, apart from shared values and aspirations, we have long-term intersecting interests, shared interests with the United States. I referred in this context to terrorism weapons of mass destruction, preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and, but there are other aspects also, and this includes the issue of energy security, where if you look at it in any uh, longer term perspective, our interests intersect, because we have for instance, a shared interest in reducing our dependence on f fossil fuels. Uh, we have a shared interest in oil prices being stabilized at lower levels and greater predictability uh, in pricing. Uh, and across the board, I would say that I do not see any area, you refer to Professor Srinivasan, our differences sometimes, on one specific area, like, like uh, for instance, you refer to Iraq. Uh, we do not have differences in terms of objectives. We do hope, both in India and the United States, that Iraq will emerge. Uh, we do hope that it will emerge as a federal democracy like India and the United States. It will take time, we know that, but we hope it will be sooner rather than later. And we hope that it will be, be stable uh, and also as a democracy and as a prosperous democracy, 
be a factor of stability in that entire region. So our goals are the same, but sometimes how to achieve those goals, that sometimes we have differences or perception based also in terms of our own historical um, um, experiences and due to other factors. Uh, but another overriding, uh, 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 another overriding uh, aspect, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, aspect of overriding importance is that our relationship is called. It's a relationship between democracies and people-to-people -people ties have always played an important role. Uh, and this has been even before we became free. Uh, and even after our freedom, uh, we've had uh, people, I mean, not just, I refer to the visit of President Eisenhower to India and the, the tremendous enthusiasm he generated, the tremendous goodwill for, uh, for the United States, which is demonstrated at that time, and which incidentally still exists. We, uh, in fact, uh, if you go across, there might be some differences in terms of some policies, but if you ask an average Indian anywhere, in any part of India, and the extent of goodwill for the United States, I would say exceeds that uh, in any other uh, Asian country, certainly ap uh, apart from the Philippines, uh, and uh, much more than many of the places where I've served, including Germany and the United Kingdom. Uh, and this is, you know, and this has been manifested in these people-to-people -people contacts between, let's say, I remember the visit of Dr. M uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. to India, when he visited India. And I was um, among one of those impromptu audi audiences, you know, which there was no, I mean, he didn't come as a, he was not a head of government, uh, but the crowds were enthusiastic. He had come, both of them had come as guests, personal guests of Prime Minister Nehru. But it was, uh, a tr a, there was tremendous enthusiasm in those, uh, in, in um, the crowds which greeted him wherever he went. And I remember what he had said in response to a question. Somebody asked him how his visit was going and he said, uh, he told that person who happened to be a, a college student uh, like myself, at that time, and he said, young man, I have not come here on a visit, I have come here on a pilgrimage to the land of Gandhi. So these people-to-people -people contacts, also the work done by people like Professor Norman Bolag and M. S. Swaminathan, these are important, uh, and they will remain important in future. And uh, in this context, I would like to say that I would like to pay a tribute to the role of the Indian American community. Uh, as a major uh, force for both promoting this relationship and act acting as a stabilizing factor in this relationship. Uh, I would conclude by saying that it's, the relationship is never as good, it has been said before, but I'll repeat it, it's never as good at it, as it is today, and it's getting better all the time. But it's still and premature to say that it can be put on autopilot that you know, it, has reached, it has not yet reached a critical mass where it can carry on on its own. It is coming close, but it's not reached that point. Uh, it will still need to be nurtured, and we'll have to build more political consensus in both countries. Uh, the, political, the kind of political consensus which was manifested, for instance, in the United States during the vote on the civil nuclear legislation but overall, uh, due to the factors which I mentioned and more, I am confident that this relationship is set to firmly set on an upward uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, thank you very much for giving me such a patient listening. I've talked much longer than I should have, but uh, as uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan said, that I would really uh, welcome uh, Questions. I would also <laughs> welcome, uh, actually, some comments uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, criticism or advice, uh, whatever you might, whatever way you might put it. I'd benefit from that. Thank you. With the address, which is a true the force of the relationship between India uh, and the United States and its evolution. I'm sure 
there are lots of questions in your mind. Please uh, line up behind the microphones at the corridor and uh, Tessie. the government of India might address those things or whether this is just a, a problem that's going to restrict us in the future? Um, I think it's a very valid point you made there, uh, uh, Tezi. Uh, uh, I think what's uh, happening is quite uh, uh, a present policy, to put it very frankly, is it's stupid, it's self-defeating. And uh, this is going to be addressed. And we should actually be doing uh, much more. We should be facilitating, not coming in the way. And one of the problems which I face, very frankly, is uh, you know, uh, is that we uh, do not have. We'll have to do some. Uh, we'll have to carry out some education reforms within our own country uh, because there's a, a lot of goodwill. There's a willingness uh, I find from uh, from a number of you know. You, uh, people in a number of universities which I have visited and have specific proposals. But a big part of the problem is the way it is constituted right now in India. It's, it's complex. I know it's complex because education, as you know, is a state subject. But there are some central, uh, some areas where the central government also is involved, but largely a state subject. But in between, you know, it's constantly uh, falling in between two stools, and uh, it's a bit of a mess. I think we can we can do a lot in clearing that up. And the least we can do, and I hope this problem, uh, particularly uh, relating to Fulbright scholarships and a num number of those problems, uh, I hope that in the coming uh, couple of months they'll be resol resolved. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Uh, thank you very much. That was very illuminating. Could you say a word uh, about the status of discussions mm -hmm. between India, Israel, and the United States about the purchase of the Arrow Defense System, please, if you feel free to uh, share some information about that? Um, right now, I don't think that there are any, uh, that, you know, it's not one system we're looking at. I think we're looking at, uh, um, uh, there are uh, certain options which, which we have, which we are exploring. And also uh, in terms of our own indigenous programs, we have some uh, mm, areas where, um, uh, which uh, I know that we were uh, uh, pursuing some collaborations also um, to uh, provide some inputs, uh, so it's not just procurement of a system, but it's uh, also involving some collaboration because we have certain strengths which we have developed on our own. Uh, but uh, I would like to say that uh, you referred to Israel. Uh, we uh, the relations between India and Israel have uh, developed uh, very, very rapidly, and. Uh, in, and Israel is uh, our second largest factor uh, and partner uh, in terms of uh, uh, defense cooperation. And the relationship uh, in the area of defense, uh, particularly, is uh, based uh, since it uh, involves uh, predictability and trust on a long term basis, uh, uh, is one uh, which has taken off very well, and that is a reflection of uh, the long-term uh, uh, trust and confidence uh, on 
the part of both the partners that are Israel and India uh, in this relationship. Uh, we have not reached that stage yet with the United States, but our intention is to get there and to get there as soon as possible. Uh, we uh, will have to overcome some problems because uh, in this area and in certain other areas, uh, so far the United States has been used to dealing with uh, allies, uh, uh, treaty allies, and uh, or with adversaries. I don't think you have many major advers adversaries at the moment, but uh, it's not. Uh, so we'll have to, it'll have to be a very specific type of relationship which you build up with India, which, which is not going to be an ally in a traditional sense because we, uh, uh, it's, it's too vibrant a democracy and it's too large a democracy and too diverse a democracy to be a follower of any country uh, and will not be. So it will, uh, uh, so we'll have to work out some mechanisms which are, are, which are not yet in place uh, to enable uh, cooperation in the field of defense to develop as both uh, our countries uh, uh, desire. Uh, so um, we are in the process of getting there. In fact, uh, next month I'll be commissioning the uh, first uh, uh, US origin uh, naval vessel uh, into the Indian Navy at Norfolk in Virginia. Thank you. My name is Subrat Chakravarti. I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the uh, U.S. and the uh, nuclear agreement, mm -hmm. uh, the Communist Party, which is a key ally of the Congress in the Lok Sabha, uh, has uh, condemned this agreement as a betrayal of principle and a strategic threat to, to India. Uh, and they have even discussed voting against the government in a motion of confidence in the parliament, which the government would then surely lose. In, if that disagreement now dies, what does that do to the future of U.S.-India relationship? Uh, it's... Uh it's not just, uh, I won't say it's the uh, Communist Party of India or uh, the Communist Party of India Marxist or the Communist Party of India or some of uh, the uh, leftist uh, supporters of the governing coalition. Uh, but there are uh, others also who have opposed uh, the civil nuclear agreement, who expressed reservations. And uh, uh, in any democracy, uh, dissent is an essential element, and, uh, and, uh, and dissent is a part of any debate and discourse that we have in our country. Uh, there have been some changes also, in, in, there's been some evolution in the thinking of some of these parties, some of the same parties which had, uh, for instance, uh, Mm, strongly opposed the nuclear tests of 1998. Uh, uh, their positions have evolved uh, and they're now uh, uh, becoming defenders of uh, the strategic program, uh, nuclear program in India. So similarly, I hope that uh, when um, perception and reality uh, come closer to each other and it takes some time you know, on any issue because, as I said, the development of our relationship has been very rapid and some people have been taken off balance. They've, it takes some time for perception and reality to intersect. Uh, but uh, I do hope that that process uh, will take place and people will realize. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, people over here, a lot of people over here in the United States also who have doubts about this agreement, and same as we have in India. But ultimately, people will realize what Professor Srinivasan said, that this is going to be something which is going to be of mutual benefit. And it's also uh, will uh, meet our shared goal of promoting 
non-proliferation because if you look at our actual track record, uh, it's uh, it's second to none. I would say, in fact, it's better than many, very, very frankly, many uh, countries which are presently in the nuclear supplies group. Uh, so uh, this is an ongoing process, and I won't uh, come to you know the type of conclusions. I don't think we'll have any situation as envisaged uh, by you. It's not even hypothetical at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm a biology graduate student here. Uh, I implore your excellency not to dismiss me as another one of those anti-globalization critic, for I ben you know, enjoy the benefits of globalization as everyone in the audience. But I yeah. honestly believe that a globalization of free trade should come with a globalization of human rights, and more importantly, a respect for that. So I would be greatly obliged if Your Excellency could explain for the benefit of the audience uh, why should U.S. invest in special economic zones in India and how the Indian government plans to ensure the rights, the life, and the livelihood of poor farmers uh, who are not trampled in the land grab to grab their prime agricultural land to establish SEZs. Given that in recent days, uh, 11 people have been killed and 17 injured in violence in West Bengal, the uh, Communist Party of India rules West Bengal, and even they haven't shown restraint. And recently, uh, Union Minister Kamal Nath has announced that he can allow private developers to acquire about 5,000 hectares of land. So what will prevent them from greedily grabbing land and go getting away with it? So how would you explain this? Thank you. Well, I'd say that uh, um, this issue, uh, this speci uh, specific issue on uh, special economic zones is, uh, is being debated in India uh, within our country, as you very well know. Uh, there's been a lot of public uh, discourse on this subject, uh, a lot of disagreements. And, but across the board, there has been, uh, uh, mm, it is a very sad uh, event, what took place in Nandigram. Uh, the police firings which in which some innocent people lost their lives because uh, they were protesting and uh, and everyone has a right to protest uh, and uh, but i can assure you that uh, uh, a decision whatever decision will be taken uh, will be uh, a balanced one uh, we will have to uh, inevitably move to, uh, as we industrialize, um, we will require uh, more land to build uh, um, uh, manufacturing plants or, or laboratories or uh, land to build more institutions of higher learning, more universities, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's inevitable. That's going to happen. So it's not necessarily going to be uh, and, and at the same time to make uh, agricultural land uh, usage um, uh, with better uh, irrigation, better inputs, uh, higher technology inputs uh, to make them more productive, to reduce losses. Uh, and that's a better way of um, uh, handling this issue. So we have to get the balance right. And in India, we cannot uh, uh, decide these issues and, uh, by, and uh, by decree or uh, central or state government fiat. But uh, at the moment, the group of ministers is uh, looking into this issue and a, a decision which will be taken, I'm sure, uh, which will take into account the legitimate interests of farmers who constitute 60% uh, plus of uh, uh, our uh, population, sixty-five percent are dependent of our population, They're dependent on agriculture, and we cannot no politician or any any anyone, nobody in any uh, uh, public position can ignore this fact. And uh, though the proportion of agriculture is it, in terms of our GDP is being declining, even in as uh, early as the eighties, it was something like about. Uh, 40% and now it's about 18% of our GDP is going to decline uh, even though I hope agriculture will pick up much faster but it will decline as a proportion of our GDP but these interests will be taken into account. Thank you. 
Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to come back to the topic of the U.S.-India civil nuclear agreement. Yes. Uh, can you bring us up to date on the state of play of the 123 agreement? And as you know, the first phase was a pretty hard slog getting it through the House and the Senate in this country. We are picking up sounds that this 123 agreement is going to be even tougher, particularly with the elections coming up. Can you tell us how you see this playing out over here? Uh, I, yes, I have heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, speculation. There has been some uh, sense of frustration which has been uh, um, uh, conveyed, I think, including in briefing people in the media and congressional staffers and congressmen. Um, all that I can say is uh, that mm, it is not necessarily uh, true, uh, but it is not our policy uh, to comment on negotiations in progress because uh, we would not like to carry out these discussions in public. So. Uh, it is very tempting for me to uh, do so because I can refute many of the things which are being put out, but it's, it's, I don't think it will serve any purpose because I'm not here uh, and it's not my intention to score any debating points because we take this seriously and we hope it is certainly difficult. And what I said earlier, that is, uh, you know, there's strong feelings in India, uh, strong views in India, a number of them. Uh, who are against uh, this agreement. There are strong views uh, which are held here. Uh, but I do believe that this agreement, when uh, the last lap is always the most difficult, and we have just uh, um, uh, uh, completed two stages and uh, have to complete uh, Mm, three more stages before we uh, finalize this agreement. And uh, uh, I'm not uh, pessimistic, but the at, at this current stage of negotiations, I would uh, not like to comment on any detail. Uh, forgive me. Thank you. May I ask the last question? Since there are you did mention in many points you mentioned that uh, India's Sorry. Indian investment abroad now exceed foreign investment coming into India. Now, on the one hand, the Indian investment increase is due to the fact our private corporate sector is not very dynamic, and they are acquiring companies abroad, the core of steel example, the aluminium uh, example, and so on. Uh, on the other side, it seems to me our domestic investment climate uh, is abysmal uh, in the World Bank's ranking of countries of uh, the on doing business. India ranks 135 uh, among uh, 170 or so, 150 or so countries. And with respect to many things, how, many, how long it takes to start a business, how long it takes to close down a business if it doesn't function, and the whole host of clearances and so on and so forth. And that is what is keeping foreign investment coming to, uh, coming to India, and also domestic investment uh, increasing much further than uh, it has. Now, what is your assessment of where we are going with respect to creating a much more welcoming uh, investment climate that go along the line from infrastructure to bureaucracy to what have you? Um, uh, Professor, I think that uh, First, I would like to say about uh, the investment uh, climate, you know, in in, in India, and uh, as you rightly put, put it, it's uh, we can and we should be doing much more. Uh, when I was in Germany, I used to hear these uh, questions all the time, uh, and so I, but it didn't quite correspond to. What I, when I talk to CEOs of a number of companies, large companies, 
the small companies, the middle stunt as they're known in Germany, or even the smaller companies. So I had requested uh, the, uh, the Federation of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry just to do a study, not an analysis, in a 15-year perspective of profitability, for instance. What is the net profitability of companies, large, medium, small companies, German companies? Because this is a matter of record, no analysis. Net profitability over a 15-year period. And they took uh, two other countries, uh, China and Indonesia. Mm, Indonesia at that time was much, uh, I mean, let's, uh, let's put it, it was more uh, stable and predictable. Uh, and one was that fact, uh, that's net profitability. Second was how much, uh, in terms of uh, how much of volatile, uh, was it volatile, did it go up or down, or was it more or less stable in terms of profitability? And the third factor was uh, the percentage of uh, companies which started business and then they had to fold up business. Uh, both in terms of number of companies and in terms of value. Another factor was time taken from initial investment to profitability. And uh, some of the answers I knew. That didn't surprise me. And this was during the, the height of, this is 15 year perspective. That means including a period where you were at the height of the license, what do you call this? License permit Raj in India. But we came ahead in all these criteria, factually. So that was very illustrating. Because, but people, unfortunately, I might mention this, but people do not uh, do not invest on the basis of facts. P they go on the basis of perception, and there's a certain herd instinct. And when you reach a certain critical mass, people ask a question: not whether I should invest in X or Y country, but can I afford not to be there? Uh, in uh, some other countries, like if you take China, for instance, much of this initial, that critical mass was built up by overseas Chinese investments. It constituted about 70%. Then, as you know, it grew. And that had a gravitational pull of its own. In India, it's going to take uh, longer for this, these realities also to percolate. And each one of the, uh, and, and so we can, as I said, Having said all of this, I think we can do much more. And we are doing it stage by stage. If you look at it, it's not, in my view, in my personal view, I think we can and could have gone faster. But even then, if you, like for instance, there's people are talking about, you know, we have reached a sort of, uh, we have lost, the momentum has been lost. Nothing's happening. There's a great disappointment. But the fact is that even if you take, just the last, you know, two or three years, let's say three years or so. Uh, if you look at import duties, we had it, as you know, Professor, it was about 29%, now it's 10%. I mean, in non-agricultural uh, areas, the peak trap rate. The applied rate has been actually about something like about six, six and a half percent across the board. Now, so we, without uh, doing anything dramatic, the fact is that we have been able to bring down, this was one of the problem areas. You spoke about infrastructure. It's, a lot of people didn't realize, you know, that in India, actually even at the height of uh, uh, the Nehru's, uh, you know, the, the position on the commanding heights of the public sector, actually the as you know, Professor, the private sector played a much bigger role in a con country like India as compared to countries like Germany or France even. When talking of privatization, you refer to telephones. Telephone privatization began in the same year in India and Germany. The telecom the regulatory authority was... Sent. But we have completed the process. Germany is still in the stage of doing so. It's Deutsche Telecom has not been fully privatized. And what was considered, you refer to infrastructure, it's, I honestly believe that, you know, today's problem can be tomorrow's opportunity. 
There again, I take telecom. It was a huge constraint. People were complaining all the time. But how can you do business? You talk of information technology. How do you conduct business without work, a telephone working? Today, it is seen as a fastest growing telecom market with a huge opportunity. We can convert every such challenge into an opportunity. But the biggest challenge where we will face a problem because of our geographical location, because of uh, the certain, um, should I say, some, um, uh, some degrees of uh, uh, uncertainty in our immediate neighborhood, uh, one problem which we will not be able to resolve just by issues on issues of policy, then that is going to be energy, because we are cut off from energy sources because of where we are located geographically. And uh, uh, we will have to diversify these sources and uh, we'll have to do much more. But we, I agree with you, we have to do much more, like for instance, without uh, going into much greater detail. I mean, we will not be able to, we will have to generate more in terms of investments. We have uh, done, we have not done that badly. There are great inefficiencies. I think we can ma make reduced transaction costs in India. But if you really look at it, for instance, with, uh, you know, about our savings rate is quite high. It's uh, around 30%, a little bit over 30%. But it's much less than China, which is about 40%. Uh, we, our investments into India is one-tenth of China. So savings rate is much lower. Investment rate is much lower. Our exports are a fraction of China. But nonetheless, the difference in terms of uh, GDP growth is about two or three percent. So something we must be doing right in our own confused <laughs> manner. <laughs> no, but we could do better. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>